Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our April edition of the Building Bridges to the Community Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Rachel Narwald, for those of you who don't know me. I am the nurse practitioner. I have the great honor to work with Dr. Eugenia Gianos with Preventive Cardiology. And we are so thrilled this evening to have Dr. Roshini Mullaney with us. She is a clinical cardiologist with Northwell Staten Island University Hospital. And she is going to be speaking with us tonight about diversity in heart disease. So she's going to discuss the rise in heart disease and heart failure within various ethnic groups and also discuss prevention and screening for those communities at risk. So as always, please know you can ask questions at any time in the Q&A section. You can type those questions in as they come to you and I will field them to present to Dr. Mullaney um, either during the, or during the lecture as we have time or at the end, of course, we'll have time for questions as well. But go ahead and put those in as soon as you think of them and we'll keep them to ask her. And as always, we are recording these talks so they will be available on our YouTube channel, Doc Heart Health, which we'll post to you all as well to see. So if anyone wasn't able to join tonight or you'd like to share this uh, once it's finished or go back and watch some of the other discussions we've had, you're always welcome to jump onto that YouTube channel, Doc Heart Health, and see the past lectures. So without further ado, Dr. Mullaney, I want to turn it over to you. And I know you have some amazing uh, discussions for us this evening. You're going to educate us on this. So we're, we're really thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joining us this evening. Um, I'm very excited to be presenting this and want to make this informal. So please, as Rachel said, if you have questions along the way, please, please send them in the chat and I'm happy to address them as best I can. Um, and so this is something, you know, a topic that's uh, near and dear to me. Um, and we're gonna talk about diversity in heart disease and how it affects different populations. Um, I'm sorry, here we go. And I'm having a bit of technical difficulty. Um, sorry about this. There we go. All right, so here we have six, 659,041 deaths per year. Now, what is that from? We have COVID and we have heart disease. Um, so that is the number of deaths from heart disease in 2019. Um, there are many different types of heart disease and that statistic in particular relates to coronary artery, artery disease, which is what we're gonna focus on this evening. Um, other types of heart disease I have listed here, are arrhythmias, congenital heart defects, valve disease, uh, diseases of the heart muscle and infections. And these are, you know, having these things doesn't exclude coronary disease as well, which is disease of the arteries, which I'm gonna show you in just a second. So here we have um, the heart here, and we have a normal artery where blood flow is nice and smooth, and there's nothing against this artery wall over here. And then on this side, we have this yellow stuff, and that's, that's plaque or calcium or cholesterol or lipid or fat, and you'll hear our doctors use all these different terms. But basically what happens over time is it starts depositing, and you can see here between both of these arteries that this one has started to narrow. And then what happens? So the plaque starts building up like this. And you can see here in this top part that the blood flow is normal. And then um, as it starts to get narrower and narrower, as plaque starts to build up over time, the blood flow gets, it gets more strained. It gets more hard. It gets difficult for the blood to continue to flow properly to the arteries. And then a clot can form and it plugs up the, the artery that's already very narrowed. And that's what causes a heart attack. So many causes of heart disease and coronary artery disease in particular are out of, out of our control. So we can't control um, our age. You know, we all age in life. Um, we can't control what ethnicity we are. We, we are born who we are. Um, we can't control our, our sex or gender. Um, and, and we can't control our family history. So those are, those are things that we kind of have to deal with. 
Um, but luckily, um, most things that influence having heart disease are controllable, such as um, things in our environment and, and behaviors and habits that we have in our life. So 80% of, of having heart disease is environmental and behavior, and only 20% is genetic. So even though you have genes, you have a parent that had heart disease, um, you still have control and, and you know, all is, you're not, your fate is not just to have heart disease. Uh, later on in life. Environmental and behavioral causes. So some really, really common ones are stress, alcohol, diet, and you can see um, stress has like a significant effect on our um, on heart disease. We have increased levels of this hormone called cortisol. And people research has found that having high levels of cortisol in the blood has been related to having um, more heart disease. Um, it also can increase blood cholesterol and triglycerides and cause weight gain. Um, it also uh, causes constriction or tightening of the blood vessels that can promote disease formation. Our diet, obviously, um, we can, we'll talk more about that um, later on, but you know, things that are healthy in the diet, such as vegetables and fruits and, and fish can be, um, can decrease your risk of heart disease and, and foods that are high in saturated fats um, will increase your risk. Alcohol also can cause an increase in triglycerides and um, many different, and ha can have an impact on the heart muscle as well. Um, some things, and I, you, you've probably heard of all of those things before contributing to heart disease, but some things that you may not, we don't talk about so much are the social determinants of cardiovascular disease, such as family life, culture, gender, race, income, um, having uh, living in a safe neighborhood, like having a safe environment, um, access to healthcare, and and education level. Lifestyle and culture can have a significant influence on, on whether you have heart disease. Um, there are certain types of foods that um, certain cultures eat that are higher in um, fats that are you know, bad for the arteries. Um, we have neighborhood safety that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, the impact on both exercise and eating healthy. If you live in an unsafe neighborhood, maybe you know children or even adults are more likely to stay inside and have more of a sedentary lifestyle. Um, also, in different cultures, there are different perceptions of of a healthy body weight. Which you know, when we when you see a doctor, you know that needs to be taken in, into consideration as well. Um, here are other markers for so socioeconomic status that have been related and associated with uh, cardiovascular disease. So we mentioned those in the last slide. So education, environmental factors, income level, and employment status. And I'll go into this a little bit more. So education level. So there's an inverse relationship between education and cardiovascular disease. So we see people um, with a higher education, they have more alcohol consumption. Um, they do tend to smoke less. Um, they do have lower blood pressure and cholesterol levels and a, a fewer rates of diabetes as well. Lower education um, has been linked to poor, poorer outcomes, um, a higher risk of cardiovascular events, um, getting suboptimal treatment for many different reasons, um, more behavioral and biological risk factors, and um, a disparity in health literacy as well. Um, there was a study that found that there's a higher risk of acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack in people with a lower educational lo in education level. Um, they also tend to have worse outcomes. Um, and Education is, is definitely related to health literacy as well. So making sure that we have tools to reach out to people that, you know, maybe pictures or things like that would, you know, influence how much people know about heart disease. Employment status. So a higher socioeconomic status um, relative to the general population um, also showed an increased risk of cardiovascular events in unemployment. So just the stress potentially of being unemployed can increase the risk of having heart disease. Outcomes of the unemployed population were um, with those of the retired cohort. So it's not, it, it was, was it in the retired cohort? So it suggests that it's, it's just the job loss itself that could potentially put in extra stress 
Um, and then that, you know, along with that potentially comes loss of insurance, loss of benefits and, and things that usually come along with the job. Um, unemployment was associated with a 35% increased risk for heart attack within the first year of being unemployed. And the risk usually came down after that. Income level. So income level is inversely associated with heart disease risk. So um, there's an increased risk of heart attack and sudden, sudden death with a low income level. And then this is a really interesting statistic that for every $10,000 increase in income for a neighborhood, there was a 10% reduction in mortality risk. And that can, you know, could be due to many different things. And that could be due to, um, you know, improvements in the neighborhood, improvements in sidewalks, improvements in the safety of the neighborhood. Um, people with uh, lower income tend to have fewer yearly medical checkups, um, less likely to use aspirin and other recommended medications. And these are the environmental factors that I kind of brought up before, but um, presence of sidewalks or recreational spaces really impact um, how much exercise people get. Um, disadvantaged neighborhoods with you know, no parks or, or playgrounds or anything like that tend to have higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, increased individual and neighborhood safety um, was associated with the lower uh, body mass index over time. Access to transportation, which could get someone to um, proper medical care also has an impact. Availability and types and costs of healthy food. Um, a lot of times, you know, a lot of um, low income neighborhoods might not have healthy foods or if the, they do have healthy foods, they're more expensive and make, it makes it unaffordable. Uh, proximity to medical care and then just safety in general. Um, so your zip code shouldn't predict how long you live, but it does. So here you can see in states across the country how neighboring zip codes, their life expectancy varies. So here you can see in New York, um, two neighboring zip codes, and I, and I didn't look up which zip codes they were, but um, they uh, you can see there's almost a, there's a nine year, I think we may have had a little technical difficulty with Dr. Malini there for a second. I'll just fill in a little bit until she pops back on. But I think it's so important, the point that she brought up about it's really not a one size fits all when it comes to uh, cardiovascular care, healthcare in general, but especially prevention. I love that she pointed out that there was the issues with um, cultural differences, ethnic differences, not only with food and um, part of celebrations and being social and things like that, but even, even as far as what a healthy body is, that that image can be different when we talk about um, different cultures. So I think as practitioners, we need to be so sensitive to that because we need to realize that it's just not going to be uh, across the board the same for everyone, especially when it comes to food deserts, if you will, where there's not a lot of healthy food options for patients. Um, oh, hi, Dr. Malini. Oh, <laughs> That's okay. No, I was just saying that it was such a, a great point that you brought up that it's really not a one size fits all, you know, when it comes to treatments for patients and how important it is when we think about ethnic and cultural differences, not only with body image, but, you know, with, with celebrations surrounding foods and things of that nature. So I was just feeling a little bit in until you got back. So thank you so much. Yes, of course. Please um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll jump right back in. Um, one second. All right. All right. So, um, so traditional, and then over here on the, the right hand side of the screen, we see traditional cardiovascular risk factors um, that we all are probably well aware of and have heard of hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, obesity, poor diet and physical inactivity. Um, and then you have the, the standard of care, which is guideline-based care, lifestyle modification and, and task shifting. 
So here we have stress and depression and how do they have an impact on heart disease? Um, so, you know, it, it is found that people that um, earn less than $35,000 a year and have stress and depression have a almost 50% increased risk of having cardiovascular disease in their lifetime. Um, it's, you know, has been found to have a lot to do with in, inadequate social or material resources as far as coping with stressful events, um, higher rates of adverse health behaviors, um, and, and, you know, it kind of goes in a, in a, in a circle there. Uh, race is a risk factor. So Blacks have a high, the highest risk of cardiovascular disease in the U.S. They're nearly two times as likely to have the first stroke and a higher risk of dying from that first stroke. Non-Hispanic Blacks, Mexican Americans, American Indians, and Alaskan Natives um, over the age of 20 have a have more uh, diabetes uh, than other populations. Non-Hispanic Blacks, Mexican-American women have a higher rate of obesity, which can in turn lead to heart disease in the future. Um, American Indians, Alaskan Natives um, are expected to die earlier from heart disease than other populations. And minorities and heart failure. They tend to have a higher risk of heart failure. Um, the highest risk is in black women. Uh, the most common reason is high blood pressure. Um, and there's been many studies actually focused on this already. And you know, obviously we definitely need more research that um, certain drugs work better in, in certain populations. So in the black population, uh, diuretics, we know that calcium channel blockers and nitrates uh, tend to treat heart failure and uh, high blood pressure better. And this is why African-Americans and high blood pressure. So more than 40% of them have high blood pressure. It's more severe. It usually develops at a younger age. Um, there is a genetic uh, increased sensitivity to salt. So a half a teaspoon of salt can raise the blood pressure five millimeters of mercury. So really, really important, especially in this population to watch the sodium intake. They also tend to have higher risk of obesity and diabetes. And then as far as prevention, so this compares uh, different ethnicities and racial groups and how, how much they use preventative methods. Um, so aspirin use you can see is highest among the white population and lowest amongst the Asian. Um, hypertension screening is highest among the white and uh, lowest among Hispanics. And cholesterol screenings, same thing, highest among white, the white population and uh, lowest amongst Hispanics. So women and heart disease. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for women in the United States, responsible for one in five um, of female deaths. Only 56% of women recognize this fact. Um, six per, and 6.2% 6 of women over the age of 20 have been found to have heart disease. Um, by race, it's uh, most common in black women, as I mentioned in the prior slide. Uh, white women are not far behind, Hispanic women also not too far behind, and Asian women are at 3.2%. There was a survey done in, in 2019 by the American Heart Association um, that compared knowledge about heart disease in women from 2009 compared to 2019, so over the course of about 10 years. So they found that women with high blood pressure were 30% less aware that heart disease was the leading cause of death. Um, among women. Um, the greatest declines in awareness were among Hispanic, Black, and uh, women that are younger, so 25 to 34 years old. Women were found in general to believe that cancer is the leading cause of death in women, especially breast cancer. Um, the general awareness of heart attack symptoms declined um, over that 10 years. Um, on, on a good side, um, knowledge to call 911 if having a heart attack increased, but knowing to take chew, or take and chew aspirin if having chest pain um, did go down. And this is um, a map of the US um, and it kind of shows in the dark red um, where there's more heart disease in, the age, in uh, women 35 and up. So you can see it's mostly concentrated in the South. Um, with kind of scattered areas of dark red throughout the rest of the country here in, here in Alaska as well. And diagnosis and treatment in women. So women tend to have smaller and lighter heart arteries. So those are the coronary arteries. Um, they tend to present later 
um, in life. They have poor outcomes after an event, and they also have more of a uh, more complications. Um, they have been found to have be less likely to be to be prescribed optimal medical treatment. And that could be for many different reasons is that they have more side effects or maybe their symptoms aren't the same and we'll go through you know, what, the, what the symptoms are in women. Um, they're usually older at the time of the events as well. Um, women tend to have, um, they're, they're more likely to also continue, uh, more likely to continue to have symptoms after treatment. Um, and their responses somewhat can be different at times as well. And these are unique risks to women. So diabetes um, increases the risk of heart disease and heart attack um, or stroke at a younger age in women. It doubles the risk of a second heart attack or stroke. Smoking, uh, women tend to, women are more likely to have a heart attack if they smoke. Um, they're less likely to succeed in quitting completely. And that, you know, has been found to have something to do with uh, hormonal, hormonal changes with um, menses and things like that, and less, less efficacy of nicotine replacement. Um, metabolic syndrome, which is a large waist size, elevated blood pressure, glucose intolerance, and low HDL and high triglycerides, um, which encompasses that, um, has been found to to be related to an increased risk of developing heart attack, stroke, and diabetes. So this is the most important risk factor um, of having a heart, like, or predictor of having a heart attack at a young age. Hypertension in women. So a study found that for every 10 millimeters of mercury increase in systolic blood pressure in women, it led to a 10% greater risk of cardiovascular disease than compared to men. So that they think this is something really, really important. So if you notice that your blood pressure is elevated, it's really important to get that um, taken care of quickly. Atrial fibrillation. So women have lower rates than men in general, but they do have a higher risk of stroke. Um, they tend to have a lower quality of life when they have atrial fibrillation. They have more symptoms. Um, they usually have longer episodes. Um, so something also that, um, you know, that affects women a little bit more. And pregnancy. So recent, recent research on uh, pregnancy and, and complications in pregnancy, such as gestational diabetes, found that there was a 26% increased risk of having heart disease in the next, in, in 10 years. So having gestational diabetes can definitely increase your risk of heart disease later on. Uh, same with preeclampsia with a 31% increased risk. Um, a premature delivery due to preeclampsia had an eight times increased risk of, of cardiovascular disease. And um, having a small or uh, preterm infant was associated with hospitalization or death from cardiovascular disease later in life. That's why it's, you know, starting at a younger age, really important to be screened for all of these things prior to pregnancy and even during pregnancy. Later in life, so um, estrogen for most of life keeps arteries very elastic and pliable. Uh, it keeps the cholesterol in check, meaning it keeps the good cholesterol very high and then it keeps the bad cholesterol low. Um, as the estrogen declines over our lifetimes, um, there's an increased risk of having high blood pressure, the cholesterol starts creeping up. Um, so, you know, we start to see more events in women, women about 10 years after menopause. Um, and now, you know, we're seeing women that have menopause earlier in life. So instead of necessarily um, having events in their 60s, we potentially could see events much earlier. Knowing your risk. So screening for heart disease. Um, so blood pressure should be screened at each regular healthcare visit, or at least once a year, if blood pressure is less than 120 over 80, which is normal. Cholesterol. So you should do a fasting cholesterol panel um, every four to six years for normal risk adults, and more often if you have um, an increased risk of heart attack or stroke. Um, weight should be monitored uh, during your regular healthcare checkup. Waist circumference, which plays into that metabolic syndrome, should also be uh, monitored as needed, if you're, especially if your body mass index is over 25, um, which is in the overweight range. And you should have a blood glucose test to check for diabetes every three years. 
Um, smoking, physical activity, and diet should also be checked at each regular healthcare visit. And blood pressure goals. So normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Um, it's noted to be elevated if it's 120 to 129. High blood pressure is actually 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. And high blood and stage two high blood pressure is 140 or higher, 90 or higher. And physical activity recommendations. So the American Heart Association recommends more than 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise or 75 minutes per week of vigorous aerobic exercise um, or both. Um, they also recommend moderate to high intensity muscle strengthening activity for more than two days a week and that's weights or resistance training. And this could be anything. You know, you don't have to be a member of a gym. Um, just getting outside, walking is sufficient. Um, getting your heart rate up. You know, if you walk with like a couple of weights in your hands, um, there's, I'll show you some resources at the end um, that are online that are available for, for exercise as well. The Mediterranean diet. So Mediterranean diet is um, important for LDL reduction, weight loss, and it was shown to have a decreased risk of heart attack, stroke, and death. Um, this is a diet high in omega-3s. So um, things with fish, almonds, walnuts, avocados, olive oil, um, things like that. Alcohol recommendations. So drinking in moderation is, is um, the key here. So for women, it's uh, one drink, or less per day. And then for men, it's two drinks or less per day or not for it staining altogether. Um, as far as cholesterol goals. So when you do your screening, um, the LDL goal is um, under 100 and that is the bad cholesterol that comes from animal products like cheese, um, high fat dairy, um, red meats, um, saturated fats, oils, things like that, or certain oils. Um, the, the HDL is the good cholesterol. That one you want at least above 40, but really above 60. Um, and that comes from the Mediterranean diet uh, type foods that I discussed earlier. Um, triglycerides, um, those are more from carbohydrates. Um, you want those under 150. Um, and these are, these are kind of your goal numbers to, to set for yourself. And what are we doing to improve? Um, we need more diversity. So including more minority population in research studies, um, you know, studying people, studying more um, of heart disease in women, what their symptoms are, how, to how they're different, um, studying different populations of people, how arteries, uh, how the arteries are different in, you know, Southeast Asians or, um, and how, how heart disease is more prevalent in certain populations encouraging minorities to enter the medical field. So sometimes it's, you know, it's easier to relate to a doctor of a certain um, ethnicity because they understand cultural norms and they understand um, how things are viewed and, and you know, how the, how the home is, is run. Initiatives for women that are available. So the Heart Truth, um, we have a, um, that's from the NIH. Um, we have Wise Women wise woman, I'm sorry, um, and the American Heart Association that has created a Spanish um, initiative for, for women, for Hispanic women especially, to educate them about heart disease. And then these are initiatives for all. Um, there's Reaching Health Equity um, by the CDC. Um, there's this um, here by the CDC about um, improving streets for walking and biking, a million hearts as well, and then um, pre-diabetes screening and awareness. So, you know, you don't even get to the, the diabetes part. And how can Northwell help? So this is the one for Staten Island, but I know there's one across the Northwell um, network. Um, we have different resources as far as weight management, diabetes support, sleep health, behavioral health, nutrition, uh, prevention, and smoking cessation. And, you know, we're happy to get these numbers out to you as well. Um, other Northwell resources that are available online. So there are, um, this one I found really, really great. There's a virtual laughter yoga um, that's free. You can sign up for that. There's nutrition in your heart, um, also online, um, Tai Chi, 
and meditation classes that you can sign up for as well. And then there's this newsletter called The Well by Northwell that you can you can sign up for and um, has different uh, topics, not just heart disease. Uh, healthy eating on a budget. It can be done. These are all websites that um, can help you with food choices, what to eat, what not to eat, recipes, and things like that. Um, and then here's our, our links for more information as far as um, the wise woman and let's go back um, and things like that. Um, any questions? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Mulaney. We do have a great question that I think ties in so well with what you've been presenting to us. So the uh, participant asks, there are cultural and language barriers creating challenges in getting my family members into a heart healthy diet and exercise routine. What can I do? Um, so I think, I think it's really important to maybe identify what those are and, and help you know, discuss them with the healthcare provider that would be understanding of them. They don't necessarily have to be, you know, of the same ethnicity, but, um, you know, for example, my, I'm, I'm Indian and my heart disease and we had to change the type of foods that um, he ate because the, the usual Indian foods are, are quite high in, in fat. So, you know, we, we kind of tweaked recipes and and would put olive oil instead of the normal oil that or ghee that we use. Um, so there are things like that, um, and then kind of talking with your with your family as well, and and making sure they're open and receptive to certain changes. Absolutely, I think that's an excellent answer. I think just making sure that the patients feel like it's a partnership with their provider is so important. Absolutely. You know, because absolutely, you know, there's things that can be discussed. Discussed. There's things that are important as far as religion, you know, not only maybe just as far as cultural or ethnic um, considerations and having a provider that's sensitive to that, I think is so important that patients feel heard, patients feel understood. I think everything can be um, tailored to certain needs, but patients need to understand that if they're not being heard, that there are going to be providers out there that, you know, are, are very sensitive to this topic. So. Yeah. And, and and within the Northwell system, I know we have a great variety of providers of all backgrounds. So I think you hopefully will be able to find someone. Absolutely. And, and just to piggyback on that, we do have another attendee asking, how would you address mistrust amongst minority groups with providers? You know, I, I do think that if you've had a, a bad experience with um, a hospital or, or another provider, um, do go in when you find a new provider with, with an open mind. Um, you, you do have to give them a chance. Um, it, it is difficult. And, and I know that um, having that experience is, is terrible. So, you know, give, give your new provider a chance to, to build that rapport and trust with you. Um, also you know, educating yourself as well, you know, reading and, and asking questions and, um, you know, using the resources that I've kind of shown you as well um, to, to make yourself knowledgeable and, and make sure you know why you're doing certain things and why you're taking medications. And um, I think it's really important to, to ask those questions and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to ask why you're taking something or, or what's going on, or if you don't understand something, you know, you know, definitely ask again and don't feel like there's a stupid question or, or you're bothering them because, you know, we have time. Absolutely. And I think that if, if it's possible, if there is a provider that you do trust and you feel comfortable with asking for referrals, you know, from them, it, it's such a great option. If people feel really comfortable, let's say with their internal medicine provider, and they can have referrals for a specialist, whether it's neurology or cardiology, that would already be a great option. That's a wonderful place to start, but sometimes it does have to be a little bit on, you know, the patient to try different providers, do research on their own. So, you know, when they can utilize people that are already in their care network, that's excellent. But sometimes it is a little bit of trial and error. Absolutely. And absolutely, feel free to move on, Dr. Millie. If there's any other questions, please, um, guys, keep interjecting. These have been great so far. 
No, no more questions. Everybody's a quiet bunch for now. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I hope uh, I hope the statistics weren't too grim for everyone. <laughs> I was I was concerned that they were quite eye opening. Um, so I think it's I think it's you know something that everyone should know and be aware of. And and uh, I think one of the biggest things that I always tell my patients and and my family members that um, you know go see doctors is to be an advocate for yourself and. And it's, you know, it's your health, it's your body, and they, it's really important to, um, you know, be in control and, and, um, and take charge of it. Absolutely. I think that being your own advocate, that's such an important take home. I hope that patients never feel that it's an imposition on the provider to ask follow-up questions. And, um, you know, let's say you get home and you think of something later, please call and ask, you know, it, it's never an imposition on our time. And if you're made to feel that way, that's maybe not the best relationship for you because we really want patients to feel like they're involved in the care plan. We know as providers that if patients understand the long-term goals, maybe understand some little tweaks that we're doing for here and there, but ultimately what the main goal is and what the main plan is, then they're going to be much more willing to implement those lifestyle modifications that we really need them to do on their own than if it's just us telling them, take this pill and you know that's where we end it. Definitely, definitely. And I, I think the biggest thing is knowing why you're doing things. So um, please, please ask us. We're, we're here to help. Um, and I think going back also talking about cultural and, and ethnic the, um, things that are personal to family or even traditions, um, you know, I think if you tell people or if you tell, talk to your provider about them and, you know, there's, def there's different, definitely ways to be creative and make sure that you're still, um, you know, appreciating your culture and appreciating your lifestyle and, and be able to also live a, a healthy one. Absolutely. And, and I do have a follow up question for you. How can someone get uh, exercise if they have limited resources? What are some options that you would give to patients? Um, as far as resources, so um, I think, you know, just getting out there, if you have, you know, a sidewalk would be, you know, just walking outside, I think is, is great exercise. Um, if you don't have weights, you know, taking a couple of cans and walking with a little bit of, you know, like some tomato soup in each hand, um, just to give a little bit more um, oomph to your exercise. Um, I think that's, that's actually one of the best things you can do. You don't need fancy equipment. You don't need fancy, like a treadmill at home or anything like that. Um, the biggest thing is to get your heart rate up and moving. So, you know, jumping jacks, like, um, doing like a jump rope or something like that is, is sufficient. And, you know, even if you do a little bit throughout the day, um, I think, you know, over the past year, a lot of people didn't have access to gyms because of COVID and people had to really get creative on, on their workouts at home. And I think that, you know, there's, um, if you have a smartphone, there's apps, there's these seven minute apps where you don't need any equipment. It gets your heart rate up. It's like high intensity, um, you can do those like intermittently throughout the day. Um, you don't need to have, um, you know, a 30 minute span of time that you're free either. So if you can get one in, in the morning, maybe one in the afternoon and one later on, that's, you know, that's a decent amount of time. So you can get your minutes in even just by, you know, just by kind of scattering it throughout the day. I think one of the biggest things I, I tell people is, you know, especially if you're working from home now is to stand and, and work at your like kitchen counter or something like that. Um, so you're not sitting all the time because a lot of people's lifestyles have become sedentary over the past year or so. Um, so you know, just things like that can really make a difference. Thank you so much. Agreed. And I did want to reference a question earlier. You had a great slide, Dr. Mulaney, about zip codes. I think it was in regard, just a patient was saying that they were having trouble seeing those zip codes. If you could maybe touch on that again, that would be great. Yeah, I can go back. Um, there was only, there was, I think most of our uh, group is in New York. So there was only two zip codes that were compared in New York. Um, I can give you those zip codes in one second. Maybe I can go back to it. Um, basically it was, it was saying that two neighboring zip codes with 
different socioeconomic statuses um, can have a really different um, life expectancy. So, and the ones that they pointed out in New York, um, and this, this was from the CDC, um, there was almost a nine year difference, but I will go back and show you one second. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and, and while you're looking for that, I'll just pose another question to you, Dr. Mulaney. What would you say if a lot of people in your family have heart disease? What should they be thinking about? Maybe what type of testing should they be focused on getting? So if a lot of people in your family have heart disease, um, you want to find out, first of all, what age they started having symptoms or they started ha they had a heart attack or a stroke or whatever it was. Um, if you have a family history of a, a first degree female relative, um, and this is first degree like your parents or siblings, um, then if it's a female relative below the age of 65 and a male relative below the age of 55, that's a definite increased risk to you. Um, and depending how old you are, it's never too, never too old to start. Uh, make sure you're getting your cholesterol checked, make sure you're getting your blood pressure checked, make sure you are, um, there's different, um, blood tests we have now to, to check for risk. Um, there's something called a high sensitivity CRP that gives us some indication of your risk. And there's also, um, a, you know, imaging test called a, a calcium score that can tell us if there's like a beginning of heart disease as well. And these are all things you can talk to your doctor about to see if you're a candidate for them. Um, but the biggest thing that you can do is stay active. Um, that's the only thing really that has been studied that can decrease your risk of, of having a heart attack or stroke if you have a family or decrease, you know, if, if you have a family history. So um, many, many different things you can do. Watch your diet and things like that. Sorry, I'm still getting to this slide. No, thank you. Absolutely. I think so. You know, I, I think one of the biggest things that we try to drive home with our patients is that they really need to be aware of any residual residual risk. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, specific things for heart disease, but it's not always that obvious. You know, there can be a lot more subtle things going on. Like you said, especially with, with women, it's very important that we think about um, any issues that women may have had with childbirth or around menstruation, things of of that nature where that actually can tell us a lot as a cardiologist of other risks that we need to think about. And I think that we really need to drive home with patients how important it is with diabetes that they're being aware that their risk is so increased, even with pre-diabetes. You know, I think we have a lot of patients that don't realize, let's say they're in that borderline range where they're in that pre-diabetic range that they can actually have some of that uh, organ damage even that's going on and that increased risk for heart disease without being diagnosed as quote unquote diabetic. Absolutely. Um, and I, I definitely think, I think it's so important to just the regular doctor's visits and, and going back to women, you know, a lot of times young women, the only doctor they see is, is their, their gynecologist. But if you notice a high blood pressure at your gynecologist's office, you know, it, it would be something to talk to your primary care doctor and, you know, you know, take note of, or see if there's anything in your lifestyle you can change. Um, if you're smoking, that's, that's the the biggest thing, you know, stop smoking. And if, if you're having trouble stopping smoking, there's multiple resources out there that we can, we can get to you. Um, you know, it's very difficult to quit and people usually take multiple attempts, um, to, to actually quit, but it's doable. And, and sometimes, you know, having additional resources to help you quit is, is really the key. And I have this slide up. Um, so if, if anyone can I answer a question about it or, um, you can kind of see here that here, uh, this one in Riverside, California, um, you can see two different zip codes here and they have almost a, almost a 20 year, uh, life expectancy difference. So these are all over the country and here in New Orleans is 54 and 80, uh, depending on the zip code. So I think a lot of this has to do with the foods that are, are oops, sorry about that. The foods that are available, um, again, going back to safety and, and, um, and access to healthcare as well. 
Absolutely. And I think just arming our patients with as many resources as we can. You know, you had great advice for people exercising. I think COVID was really just a game changer for so many patients, <laughs> you know, for everyone, really. Uh, we may have been doing great before. We may have not been doing so great. You know, it, it, it was either really beneficial for people that found that they had more time or were home more and could exercise more in their home uh, or were really big gym goers. And then unfortunately, were not able to to do that. So I think what we really need to think about as providers is making sure that patients have as much education as possible. You know, there's, there's always going to be an excuse for all of us, you know, for why it's hard to exercise and why it's hard to eat right. And uh, I loved that you talked about that it can be doable as far as an expense uh, standpoint for healthy eating. Um, you know, I think that that's a, a thing that we hear a lot. And I think that we really need to be able to provide options for patients because for a lot of patients, yeah, it might be easy to go get some quick fast food for $5, you know, whether trying to plan something healthy, but there's a lot of options nowadays with food delivery services, you know, whether it's a green chef or, or a, a hello fresh, you know, where you're getting those meals delivered to you pre-portioned out where you're still cooking, but you know, you don't have to buy all those ingredients and then waste that, you know, whole stash of broccoli because you only needed a little bit, you know, things like that, where we're really arming people with healthy options because otherwise you're starving, you come home, you're going to quick, you know, pick the quickest option, the most convenient option. And, and we're all like that. And, and I think one of the biggest things as uh, we try to do as providers in, in our practices is tell patients, listen, we, we don't expect perfection. No one's perfect, you know, but we really want to give them those tools for when those challenges arise for all the options and resources and support they have for how to overcome those challenges. And that we're going to have days that are great. We're going to have days that are not so great <laughs> and that it's a balance for everyone, you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and, you know, Sometimes you, you have to, you, you're hungry and you need fast food, but you know, when you have the choice of something grilled versus something fried, you know, pick the grilled option. And I think New York, New York state actually has a great, you know, they have the calories listed of, of the fast food options and maybe pick a fast food restaurant that's healthier, like, um, you know, something that has grilled meats and, and veggies and things like that. So you're not having French fries or, or, um, you know, something that would be fried or, or high in cholesterol. Um, so picking and choosing options that are, that are quick and accessible, but also, also healthy. And I think a lot of it is, is actually knowing, knowing the difference, you know, I think the big, one of the bigger questions I get is what oil is healthy. And, um, you know, you know, people hear vegetable oil and they're like, oh, it's a vegetable. It, it must be healthy. But, you know, it's actually it's really high in saturated fat. It does. It's what things are usually fried in um, because it goes to a high temperature. And, you know, that's something, you know, you have to you have to think about. And and it's hard to replace olive oil with that. But then, you know, you have to think about how you want to fry it. So air frying is something that I always recommend to my patients. You know, if you can, if you have that device that does it at home, it really gives a good texture or baking in the oven instead of frying is, is also another option. So kind of little creative tweaks you can make to your meals. Absolutely. I love that you talked about that because I really do try to give patients options because I don't expect them to go home and change everything about their diet. It's not sustainable. It's not realistic, you know, and what we're hoping for with patients is something that's sustainable over their lifetime, you know, not these quick fixes, not these fad diets. Uh, I too love the air fryer. Um, as, as far as the olive oil, it's such a great point. If you're cooking at a little bit of a higher smoke point, you know, avocado oil can be a great option, you know, cause you can cook a little bit higher uh, there and not have that burned taste, you know, that you might get. Um, something I'd love for you to touch on is some of the more fad diets, if you will, let's say the paleo, the keto, you know, what, what advice would you give to people about that? So again, I, I think the biggest thing with these and what Rachel said, it's, it's about a lifestyle and something that's sustainable over time. A lot of these diets are very restricting and, and they're not sustainable. So yes, there might be weight loss in the short term, but they, um, they might affect your metabolism in a negative way, or they're there. Once you resume your normal diet, the weight piles right back on. So it's really teaching your body how to burn fat and calories efficiently, and also, um, you know, burn what you have that you have stored also quickly and efficiently. 
Um, intermittent fasting, I think, is 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 something that's new and people are doing, and it it is overall restricting calories. Um, I do think there is some benefit to it as far as like resetting metabolism, but in you know the caveat is is that when you aren't in intermittent fasting, you do still have to make healthy choices. So, you know, if you're only eating from 12 to 7 p.m. during that time when you are eating, you still need to get, um, you know, healthy fats. You need to get vegetables. You can't, you know, just eat whatever you want during that time because it really is is the type of calories that you're getting. Um, a lot of times, if, if food is too restricted, um, then your body gets, you know, your body's, you know, kind of wired to think that it's not getting enough food and it could actually have the reverse effect where you actually gain weight because the metabolism slows, it, it holds on to fat and calories and it burns things, um, at a much slower rate. So that's, a, that's something else to keep in mind. Um, these diets are not for everyone. Um, especially if you're, you know, maybe diabetic, um, it's, that's some, another thing to keep in mind too. You do need to keep your your blood sugar at a, um, you know, a steady rate. So I think it's something to maybe talk to your doctor about if you're interested in some of these diets. Um, another thing is the keto diet or the Atkins diet. That was, you know, the, that true keto diet where, you know, you can eat any type of meat and avoid all the carbohydrates. And that one, we're finding that people that ate meats that were high in saturated fats are coming back with, yes, they might lose weight, but they're having really high LDLs and, and cholesterol levels. So the real, you know, when you're doing the keto diet, again, it's important to stick with lean proteins. So uh, like white meat, um, like chicken and turkey and things like that. And then, you know, the best of all would be, would be fish. Absolutely. I think that's such a great point. I always try to make sure to tell patients that no entire food group is your enemy, you know, but things aren't created equal, right? As far as carbs and fat. So we don't want people just eating a bunch of refined carbs, white bread, white rice, white sugar, you know, that that's devoid of nutrients, but those complex carbs are very important. And exactly, as you said, for our diabetic patients, you know, a lot of our um, patients with diabetes need to make sure that they're getting a consistent carb diet. And that's so important to talk to your doctor about. And then it's the same idea with fats. So exactly what you said about this keto, this paleo idea, you know, we want patients to focus on unsaturated sources of fat. So everything you mentioned, the fish, the nuts, the, the olive oil, the avocados, and avoiding those saturated fats. You know, I think it's funny because we're talking all about trust tonight and, you know, uh, putting trust in our providers and things that I'm about to say, but I don't think that there should be a lot of trust uh, with the food industry, with the marketing industry. I agree. <laughs> because think about all the products that market themselves as healthy, right? Well yeah. And I, I think going back to when cereal was marketed as healthy, I, I think that is a, still a big misnomer. Um, people, you know, and they're like, oh, I, I, I'm, I eat a bowl of cereal in the morning. And while it's, it's easy and it's quick and it's great, you really need to read that label on the cereal and the type of cereal that you're eating because it can be really high in sugar and carbohydrates. So again, looking at a cereal that's high in fiber, which is really important for redu reduction of cholesterol levels, uh, making sure maybe there's some nuts in there so you get those omegas. Um, doing something that's, you know, more of the complex carbohydrates as opposed to um, just like white sugars. Um, so, and again, it's, it's portion control too. So a lot of those nutrition labels will, you know, they'll tell you that the portion of cereal is, is very small and you, you know, most of us, those bowls that we have at home are not, not small. <laughs> so, you're, getting, yeah. <laughs> you're getting more than one portion and, and, you know, those calories can add up when you think you're having a very nutritious breakfast. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of patients might be somewhat comfortable with looking at maybe some of the more obvious things on a nutrition label. Let's say the calories, uh, that serving size, as you said, you know, the fat content, but looking for those more hidden things, you know, something might say all natural peanut butter, but then you turn it over and in the ingredients, it says palm oil. 
right? That's something we really, really want patients to avoid. If you're going to be getting an all natural peanut butter, it should literally just be ground peanuts. Maybe it's a tiny bit of salt, you know, but, but it doesn't need extra oil. And I think that's another thing we, we tell patients a lot about trans fat. Well, listen, the, the marketers got smart because it might say zero saturated fat, but what they're allowed to have is a certain amount. And so you need to look in that ingredient list, avoid anything that says hydrogenated or part partially hydrogenated oils. Uh, those are what trans fats are. And also educating patients that those first three ingredients in an ingredient list are usually the ones that are the most, right? So uh, I think that's something that a lot of patients don't know, looking for those hidden sugars, hidden salts, you know, really teaching them to be knowledgeable with those nutrition labels is really important. Yeah. I think a, a trick that I always, always say, if, if there's too many ingredients. It's it's not <laughs> probably you know, exactly. it's like a paragraph long. Then you know, right? If you can't pronounce half of them, <laughs> exactly, it's probably something you should avoid. So exactly. I think that you know, I want patients to have trust in their providers, have confidence in their providers, but but to be be more skeptical of 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 some of those marketing tricks, you know, because those people are trying to sell foods and they're trying to sell their product and they don't necessarily have the patient's best interest at heart. So that that's a really big take home uh, that I want patients to have. So thank you for touching on that. <laughs> And I, I think, you know, that I've really touched on all the questions. If anybody has any final questions, please throw them in that Q&A. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mulaney. This was so, so uh, important, I think, um, you know, in this day and age, and just that patients be as educated as possible so that they're involved in their treatment. Because we know as providers that that's going to help them be the most successful moving forward, right? Absolutely. Um, and again, um, as I've said multiple times, and Rachel has mentioned too, we're we're here to we're here to help. And um, our email or my email is available. I won't offer yours up, but um, you. that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we are we are here to help and and get people in touch with the resources that they need um, um, to to have a healthy lifestyle. Absolutely. And, you know, as we touched on earlier, if there is a provider that you feel very comfortable with and feel very fond of, always ask, you know, for, for referrals, for providers that they would recommend, because usually that means that they're going to be very similar as far as their treatment or, you know, be very open to, to working with you as a patient and making sure you understand why you're taking your meds, what they're doing, what, what you can do on your own, because listen, we can provide you all the meds that we want, but if you're not doing, um, those important things on your end, the diet and the exercise and getting good sleep and not smoking, things like that, it, it, it's never going to work out as well as we'd like it to. So it, it really needs to be a partnership. And just to touch on what Rachel said too, usually if, if we're able to refer, that means there's a relationship between providers. So the providers really work together to make sure that your overall care is, is really comprehensive and, and all kind of fits together. It's not like one person's doing one thing and the other person's doing another. So um, that's another real a great benefit of, of referrals. Absolutely. That's such a great point. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. This was such, I could talk about this all night, but I won't keep everybody here too late. I know it's getting late, <laughs> but I did want to mention that uh, next month's talk is going to be on uh, May 10th, also at 7 p.m. And it's going to be a panel of experts. It's going to be conducted all in Spanish. So the topic is from head to toe. So there's going to be specialists about stroke, about heart disease, internal medicine providers. So basically all the topics that you're going to be interested in, and it will all be in Spanish. So please, please let family and friends uh, know about it. And as always, it will be recorded and will be put on our YouTube channel, Doc Heart Health. So you can go back and watch any of the talks that you didn't get a chance to, or just want to revisit. And um, please do reach out to me if you have questions if you need help, if you need referrals, things of that nature, we're here to support you and just put you on that best health journey that we can. Thank you so much for joining us on this evening. We really appreciate your time. And Dr. Mulaney, thank you so much. This was so wonderful.
Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Rachel, for having me. And thank you to everyone who joined and thank you for all the great questions. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Please join us next month. We look forward to seeing you then. And in the meantime, take care. Take care. Good night.